Hello everyone and welcome to the Dairy XNet webinar. My name is Mirai Shaheen. I am an Extension Dairy Specialist at the University of Idaho and I'll be the moderator today. Today's webinar will address troubleshooting design-based cow comfort issues. Our presenter is Dan McFarland from Penn State Extension. Dan received his bachelor's and master's degree from Iowa State University. He has worked as an agricultural engineering extension educator at Penn State University since 1989, focusing on animal shelter, improving existing dairy and livestock facilities, and environmental system design. Dan works closely with county extension educators, dairy and livestock producers, and ag professionals. His educational efforts include farmstead and um, farmstead and layout, uh, ventilation system design and management, animal comfort and well-being, salt design, feeding area design, animal cooling, watering systems, and manure collection and transfer. In addition to his regular duties, he has written articles for national dairy publications, prepared uh, papers for AFABE and NRAES conferences, and been an invited speaker at industry-sponsored seminars on topics related to cow comfort and animal shelter design. So without any further delay, I'd like uh, to invite Dan to start this presentation. Okay, thank you very much, and I appreciate the opportunity to share some things I've learned about troubleshooting design-based cow comfort issues over the years. Um, it's a big topic for a relatively short time. I've tried to uh, provide some reference materials for you that may be helpful as support and perhaps some of the things we won't be able to get to today. Um, first, I think we need to know a little bit about what at least I consider some of the dairy shelter basics. Uh, you need to provide excellent air quality, a dry, comfortable resting area, good access to feed and water, and a confident footing. These things are essential to animal comfort and well-being, and they cannot be compromised. And so uh, any housing facility, whatever type it is, should contain these five elements. The elements on the right are desirable, but they benefit the caregiver mostly. Simple animal handling and movement, good observation, simple sorting, isolation, restraint, easy feed delivery, management and removal, and easy manure collection and removal. These allow the caregiver to be more productive uh, by allowing them to do their tasks properly, on time, and consistently. It's a little bit easier to know what you're after if you know what the problem is. And uh, all of the things listed here can be related to facility uh, design and uh, features in there. But they can also be caused by other things, such as uh, uh, inconsistent or poor feed quality and uh, perhaps lack lackluster management. It may not seem that time is very important to cows, but apparently it is. Rick Grant at Minor Institute in Shazy, New York, put together this time budget, this daily time budget for a dairy cow. They spend anywhere from three to five hours a day eating in a number of bouts, 12 to 14 hours resting. Some social interactions, ruminating and drinking take up, you know, approximately uh, 20 uh, and a half to 21 and a half hours per day. So they've got a pretty busy day. And so something to note here, too, is the time spent away from the pen should be limited to about three hours per day. If you're going to troubleshoot cow comfort issues and compare uh, the facility that you're evaluating to the ideal, then you're going to need to measure something. And often this is uh, done by the space, whether it's uh, length, width, or height uh, within the animal space, uh, time, time spent away from the pen, time in the milking parlor, uh, time eating, those types of things need to be observed, and also some percentages. But most importantly, you need to observe. And this takes time. Both You need to observe both short-term and long-term uh, in the facility to see how cows are reacting to the environment they're presented. It's often very useful to use time-lapse photography in this. So this is something I've found very helpful, where you can take an image maybe every minute or every five minutes over a long period of time and compress that observation and uh, be able to notice trends a lot more quickly, especially when the operator or the caregivers may not be there. And it also maybe brings uh, 
some things out that the producer isn't mentioning or you're not necessarily fully taking their word for what goes on on a daily basis. Again, all of these things here listed here are very important and uh, are facility-related, facility but they may not be facility-related. For instance, a hock injury is definitely caused by, in many cases, by the surface that the cow is resting on. But in cases I've found that because of poor uh, flooring, that the cows are resting too long, and as a result, uh, that hock injury is similar to a bed sore. In other cases, you know, poor feeding or uh, slug feeding, that type of thing can cause laminitis, but excessive standing, poor stall design, those types of things, overcrowding, can contribute to further lameness in those uh, cases. In preparing this presentation and realizing relatively limited time that we're here to talk about it, I did talk to a number of other people who do evaluation of facilities and tried to get a list of what they feel the most important things they find uh, in dairy facilities that limit cow comfort and performance. And our lists were pretty similar, and so these are the things I'm going to try to focus on today. Stocking density, resting area, access to and availability of feed, and time away from the pen and heat stress. In your reference materials, I've included a dairy facility risk factor sheet that I prepared with my colleague John Tyson. And in here, it gives a number of measurements and uh, uh, features of feeding, water, air quality, heat stress abatement, stalls, and overcrowding. Each of the factors is, has a risk factor of low, medium, or high. And you can, you, these measurements are usually done early on in the evaluation. You can go through the facility and see how they compare to this risk factor, and it helps you focus on what the problem may be. Let's look into stocking density. Overcrowding, basically you take the total number of cows minus the total number of stalls available to those cows and divide by the total number of stalls, and we get multiplied by 100, we get some percentage. So in this case, 144 cows with 120 stalls available, we get a 20% overstock overcrowding rate. Another method that's maybe a little easier to use I call population, which basically takes the total number of cows in the group divided by the total number of stalls, and the result is 1.2 cows per stall for our example here. <clears throat> Some work done in 2008 looked at uh, how overcrowding or crowding of the facility has an effect on milk yield. And you notice in this chart here, uh, the group that's uh, 80 to 100 percent populated and the group that's 100 to 120 percent overpopulated uh, are about the same milk production. But once we exceed that 20 percent, then there's a significant drop in milk. Now my understanding is in this particular study it was done in a two-row group, and so there was uh, adequate feed space for 100 uh, percent population in this particular case. But what Rick Grant uh, noticed in a presentation that I did with him recently is what are the economics associated with losing 12 pounds of milk per day per cow because of that overpopulation, and is it really worth it? There are some cow responses due to overcrowding, greater aggression and displacements at the feed bunk, which usually results in a faster feeding rate, which can lead to slug feeding. Uh, because of the over overpopulation, there's less resting time available, less stall availability, and therefore increased idle standing in the alleys, which can uh, lead to uh, more severe lameness. Of course, decreased rumination time, and then as a result, subordinate cows uh, in this group are the most affected uh, by the overcrowding. Some of the possible economic losses are listed here. Of course, uh, reduced milk yield, lower milk fat, greater max health count sometimes because of the stress and, and dirtier conditions, perhaps, more health disorders, increased lameness, and fewer cows that are pregnant. What is optimal? Well, typically it's field in two-row freestall groups not to exceed 115 to 100 percent, 20 percent uh, overpopulation. Um, if you have a mixed group of first lactation cows with older cows, it's recommended 
because of that uh, dominant submissive behavior between the first lactation and older cows, perhaps to keep it at 100% uh, population. In three-row freestall groups, we typically look at 100% or an even uh, population to the number of stalls, uh, simply because of the feeding space available to the cows. For close-up and fresh cows, we want to have them have the same availability to the feed or the same opportunity to get the feed when it's delivered. And so for these cows, these special cows, uh, we'd like to see about 30 inches of feed space per cow and then ensure that they have stalls available to them as well. Troubleshooting the resting area, we'd like to see cows rest, high-producing cows rest anywhere from 12 to 14 hours a day. Uh, 10 to 14 hours a day is typical for uh, dairy cows. I am confident that with good stall design and management, good pack management, that we can achieve these, uh, this resting time uh, in dairy facilities. The resting area, of course, should encourage the cows to use the area. You want them to come to it readily, provide comfort and confident footing while they're there, and then promote cleanliness and, and good udder health. Interestingly enough, lying time takes priority over eating and cows will actually sacrifice eating time to compensate for that lost resting time. And in order to make up for that reduction in eating time, they'll increase the rate at which they feed, which can lead to slug feeding, which can cause some issues. Some indicators of resting area comfort are locomotion scoring. Locomotion scoring is kind of an uh, issue of whether the cows are, are standing too much, uh, which may lead or contribute to lameness. We'd like to see lameness scores of uh, one, where the cows, when she's standing, her backbone is level. When she's walking, her backbone is also level, uh, greater than 75% of the herd. And then a lameness score of two, where when they're standing, the backbone is level. When they're walking, it's slightly arched, less than 15%. So we'd like to see all the herd no worse than that score of one or two. Hawk assessments are an indicator of stall comfort. Uh, the hawk is resting against the stall surface when the cow is resting, and the cow does rest on both sides, uh, and so you'll see hawk injuries on both, uh, both hawks in, in most cases uh, if there is a, a hard resting surface. There are a number of different, there are, there are a few different assessment charts here. It's a score of one, two, or three, where a score, a score, a score of one is no hair and no swelling, uh, and then a score of two is some hair missing but no swelling of, of that joint. And we'd like to see 95% of the herd or more uh, in a score of one, uh, less than 5% in a, in a score of two. Hygiene score is an indicator of uh, stall grooming and also bedding management. We're, it's a, uh, looking at the, the cleanliness of the cow. And here in this chart, there's a, a score of uh, one to five. And we'd like to see greater than 90% of the herd a score of one to two, relatively clean. Some stall use measurements that are used, one is the cow comfort index, which takes the total number of cows lying in the stalls divided by the total number of cows touching the stall. They may be perching two, two feet in the, the stall or standing in the stall, uh, but uh, they're touching the stall in some way. And typically, we, uh, we like to see greater than 85% with that particular uh, scoring index. The stall use index is one I like a little bit better because it does take the cows that are eating into account. So you look at the total number of cows lying in the stalls divided by the total number of cows in the group that are not eating. Uh, because if they're eating, they're working. We like that behavior. Uh, and so we look at these and look at 75% or more is de desirable in these cases. But there's some things to remember with these indexes. They don't work perfectly. Uh, first of all, cows have a cyclical behavior, and stall use is generally lowest uh, one hour after milking. They come back from the milking center. Typically, they're to feed uh, the feed bunk eating, and so there's very low stall use during that time, but we want them, we encourage them to uh, be at the feed area at that time. Now, there's a sharp increase during the next few hours. Hour two to three, you'll see a big increase of cows going from the feeding area now and using and so generally uh, very high uh, percentage of use uh, within hour two to three after they return from the milking center. There's also a very high percentage during the night and early morning hours of cows resting in the stalls. 
Now, this picture was taken about nine o'clock uh, in the morning, and if you if this, the time the only time you went into the barn and looked at that, you would say that stall use is very good. Other than some stall position problems there, uh, the stalls are occupied. But in truth, this is very shortly after the cows were allowed access uh, to the majority of the stalls after they had uh, uh, been through the milking center. Uh, the next slide here shows very typical behavior in this herd. Uh, it shows here a little after 2 in the afternoon on a relatively comfortable uh, day as far as temperatures and, and uh, so on. But in reality, this behavior started about uh, 10 or 10.30 uh, in the morning and was very typical throughout the day. And so here you see a lot of perching in the stall, the half in, half out, standing in the stalls or standing in the alley, but not necessarily accepting the stalls very well. So observation of stalls takes time, uh, and you need to look at it at several times during the day to get an accurate uh, evaluation of how the stalls are using. Another thing that comes into effect is that heat stress does affect resting behavior. Cows tend to stand longer periods of time uh, when they're under heat stress, uh, perhaps because they can expose more of their body area to the environment to help get rid of the heat rather than if they're laying down. And don't be fooled by overstocking. Here the stall design was very good and, and the comfort was very good as well, as you can see by the very uh, good acceptance of the, the cows in this, in, in this particular shot. So if you look at the cow comfort index and the stall use index here, it, it's very close to 100%. However, there's 114 cows and 81 stalls available, so about 1.4 uh, cows per stall. So uh, quite excessive overpopulation, which leads to this type of stall use. And so don't be fooled by that overcrowding. Um, while the stall design is good, it's, uh, the overcrowding is, is uh, not working very well on that herd. <clears throat> of course, the physical components of the stall are very important. The dimensions, the structure, stall bedding, and bedding all affect how the cow will uh, accept the stall and use it. Suggested free stall dimensions are based on animal size, and we recommend that the largest cows in the group determine that size. Um, or the stalls will determine the largest cow in the group uh, eventually. There are good charts available uh, on stall design, but uh, be generous when it comes to stall dimensions. The cows will, will appreciate that. One of the common problems with stall structure is neck rail position. Quite often it's put in place to help keep the stall clean. But the actual purpose of the neck rail is to uh, preserve lunge space so the cow can rise easily after she's resting. It allows her to get into the stall. stall cows lie down on a stall. They don't crawl into them. And so we want that cow to get all four feet on the stall surface and then go into her reclining position. If you see cows perching, excessive cows perching, or standing in the stall with their head above the neck rail, it's usually an indicator that the neck rail is too low or too far back. A quick check to do is to measure diagonally from the cow side of the neck rail to the rear of the cushion portion of the stall. In this case, where the neck rail is 50 inches high and 68 inches uh, ahead of the uh, rear cushion of the, of the stall, uh, these are very common dimensions for large breed Holsteins. Uh, then using the Pythagorean theorem, we can figure that diagonal out as, as 84 inches or 7 feet. And this is a good quick check to go into a barn and, and uh, check to see if that neck rail position is in place. And relatively, this can work pretty well. If you've got an a, a instance, for instance, where the neck rail is only 46 inches above the resting surface, uh, then what should the position of that neck rail be horizontally? And again, using the Pythagorean theorem, you can figure out very quickly that that's 70 inches. So pushing that ahead may allow those cows to get in the stall better. But the dimensions are a good start. You really need to observe the cow and see what they're doing. It's, they're the ultimate judge of how the, cow, how the stall is going to work. And so one of the key things I look for, again, looking for the largest cows in the group, can they enter that stall straight on? their backbone level, front and rear legs square under them, and maybe just touching the neck rail. Then I'm confident that that cow can rest on the stall, get in the stall, recline comfortably, 
and also uh, get up and leave the stall easily as well. Another issue that comes up very commonly with uh, free stalls or resting area is the brisket locator position. The purpose of this brisket locator is to discourage forward movement when the cow is resting, again, preserving that lunge space. We want to provide adequate body space for that cow to get on the resting surface. And again, it should be positioned for the largest cows in the group. If you don't provide that, here in the upper left, we see these cows are actually hanging off the back of the stall excessively. And in uh, videos you can see, or time lapse, you can see that there's a lot of leg movement here. And that bottom leg is moving, and that increases the incidence of hock injury in many cases. Now in the bottom right, you might say, well, golly, that, that stall looks pretty good. I mean, those cows are all laying down, and their rear ends are right over the back, so the manure and urine is going to go right into the scrape alley. But again, you can, in time lapse, you can see the movement of that. You typically see more uh, hock injuries in a case like this. Where I like to see the cows, and it's often hard to convince producers of this, is to, they're resting maybe four to six inches ahead of the rear curb. This is what uh, is often referred to as a restful posture. That leg movement almost stops. The cows are up on the stall base resting comfortably and uh, tend to work out, uh, tend to, it tends to work very well. Also, in herds where cows have tails, they often bring their tail up on the stall bed if they're in this position. Uh, and uh, that keeps them, it can improve those hygiene scores and keep them a lot cleaner. Now, one thing it's a little harder to convince and a little harder to adjust in many cases in troubleshooting is the stall grooming and bedding addition. Uh, stall grooming is recommended three times per day, possibly even more in overcrowded facilities where uh, there's more frequent stall use and then more manure on the stall as a result, or more soiled areas, and also the addition of bedding. Uh, especially stalls with mattresses and, and mats uh, do not provide the full comfort that a cow wants, perhaps, compared to generously bedded stalls, and so the addition of bedding needs to make up for that. And so frequent addition of bedding just helps with hygiene as well as comfort. And uh, although it's a little more difficult to convince that change to be made as compared to moving a neck rail forward or a brisket locator forward. Since feed seems to be a fairly important uh, element in, uh, in the uh, health and well-being of, of a cow, let's uh, spend some time talking about that. Feeding space, if we want cows to eat large, free, large frame cows to eat all at once, 27 to 30 inches per head is recommended. Uh, if you use a TMR, delivering it twice a day, provide good access uh, for the uh, feed as well as time for the cows to have available to it, then 18 inches uh, is kind of the low end of that with good management of the feed bunk. Dry cows, uh, because they aren't fed like lactating cows and need an equal opportunity uh, to the feed when it's delivered, 27 to 30 inches is recommended there. Also for post-fresh cows, to have that equal opportunity at that stage of their lactation is very important as well. If we compare two row and three row uh, shelters of similar stall numbers, uh, in the upper portion here, the two row head-to-head -head facility will provide about 27 to 30 inches of feed space per, per stall uh, in, uh, in, that, in a well-designed two row facility. In a three row facility, we're about in the range of 19 to 20 inches per stall. And you notice the length here, too. The same number of cows, but the length of the feed bunk is shorter. And so that means that pile has to be higher, wider, or delivered more often in order for the cows to get good access to that feed. Also important is their access from the resting area to the uh, uh, feed bunk. And so crossovers every 6 to 80 feet make good sense as far as providing more uniform consumption of that feed along the entire length of the feed bunk. Feed barriers, post and rail, are very common. Uh, general recommendation is 48 inches above where the cow is standing, 8 to 12 inches uh, ahead in order to allow them good reach. Uh, it's important to note here that cows are willing to exert up to 500 pounds of pressure to eat, but tissue damage can uh, be caused at 225 pounds of pressure. And so cows will actually injure themselves in order to reach feed. And so keeping this rail out of the way so they can reach feed 
comfortably without getting hurt is a very important feature to look at. Headlocks, it's just important to make sure the cow can easily get her head through the opening that's provided uh, as well as, as reach feed. And in many cases, tilting the top of the headlock forward uh, four to six inches allows that cow to get her toes right up against the feed barrier and also her shoulders fit in better so that she can reach further. It only takes about 20 minutes for the first cows that get to the feed bunk to push feed far enough away to make it difficult for the next group that would come up to eat. And so it's important they have a good reach as well as the, you need to push that feed back. Feed should be available 21 hours a day. Uh, it's recommended TMR be delivered two times a day or more. Uh, bunk density around that 100%. But the important feature here is after feed is delivered, for every half hour, for the next two hours, it should be pushed up. Again, as I mentioned, it doesn't take long for those cows to push feed out of reach, and especially in the three-row facilities or where feed space is limited, you need to have the last cows that come back from the milking center have just as good access to that feed as the first ones that come. Water access is important, at least two water stations per group, two to four inches, preferably in the range of three and a half to four inches of accessible trough perimeter. I like to see troughs uh, used rather than individual uh, bowl units uh, simply because more cows have the opportunity to drink at the same time. A good place to put these waters is in the crossovers so that they have good access uh, after they eat to, uh, uh, as they're going to the resting area, they have good access to water. Some studies I've done in the past uh, say the cows are coming back uh, on the left-hand side of this uh, group here. Uh, in the range of 25 to 30 percent of the water is consumed at the water to the left, in the range of 40 to 50 percent in the center, and the remainder at the far end. And so that, those, you know, providing that water conveniently to the cows is, uh, is very important. Time away from the pen can limit resting time, feeding time, and access to feed. And this is one thing that a number of people have pointed out, and I've found too, that the more time they spend away from the herd, uh, or from that group, the less time they have to do these things, the more problems it can cause. So the goal is around three hours to, per day uh, total away from the pen. Uh, that gives them adequate time to meet that time budget that uh, Rick Grant put together uh, to eat, rest, socialize, and ruminate. Uh, time away from 10, here is a study done comparing three hours versus six hours a day away from the pen, looking at cows and first lactation animals. Um, and you see by the chart there that it, as far as the change in resting time, there was a change from two and a half to four hours per day uh, in resting time, which is significant. And also five to eight pounds per day, a change in milk. Also, it's fine found that lameness is more prevalent in high-producing herds that uh, have greater time away from the pen. So limiting that to uh, three hours a day, and this is something that, that is really important in, in uh, troubleshooting, is to look at how the group size compares to parlor capacity, how much time they're uh, spending away, and how that can be adjusted if it's exceeding that three hours per day. We look at heat stress, the signs of uh, heat stress in dairy cattle. A rectal temperature above two and a half uh, degrees Fahrenheit, respiration rates over 80 breaths per minute, and dry matter intake and milk production drops at 10 percent. It's now kind of indicated that the temperature humidity, when temperature humidity index goes over 68 degrees, cows are starting to uh, uh, feel the effects of heat stress. The key in this is to try to not let them, meet, you know, get to that point. And so we look at the methods that can be used to reduce heat stress. Of course, shade is very important. The building is going to uh, uh, create that. But also uh, air, the air exchange to remove moisture. Cows are producing a lot more moisture during uh, the summer because they're panting more, producing more, urinating more. And so we want to get that moisture out of the building. So we're providing that with a good air exchange, open sidewalls or, if necessary, fans in order to do that. Circulation fans to provide air movement around the cow so that uh, uh, the rate of her heat exchange to the environment uh, can be greater. It's very important to, in very hot days or hot weather to keep those fans going at night because you have a greater temperature difference, differential between the cow and the uh, outside 
And so there's a greater rate of heat exchange from the cow. So the air movement of three to five miles an hour over the cows uh, in order to keep them comfortable. And also water. Of course, drinking water can increase, uh, intake of water can increase maybe 20 to 50 percent depending on their stage of lactation uh, during hot weather. And so it's important to have convenient access to that so they can get it when they want it. But also evaporative cooling, whether it's sprinkling cooling, which we call direct cooling, where you're soaking the skin intermittently and drying it off, evaporating that moisture from their skin and pulling the heat away from them, or indirect, which is basically evaporating uh, a mist into the air to reduce the temperature surrounding the cow so that the uh, uh, rate of heat exchange is greater in that case. All of these things can be used to reduce heat stress during the summer. Rumination behavior is very important. The target is eight to nine hours per day. And here are some of the things that can affect that rumination time. Overcrowding can affect it up to 20%. Heat stress, 10 to 22% in, in, in some cases. And as uh, veterinarians tell me, if a cow's panting, she's not ruminating. And that can uh, lead to uh, uh, slug feeding and also some issues uh, in the rumen. Um, mixed parity pens, up to 19% reduction in rumination time. And excessive time locked up at the feeding area, maybe up to 14% can reduce that. Rumination is very important in uh, the comfort and well-being and production of the cow, and so we want to keep that in mind as we're troubleshooting these facilities. Okay, uh, troubleshooting, you know, design-based uh, uh, facility-related things is, is uh, uh, very important. Uh, I think it's important to realize that, you know, the cow is spending 75% of her day either eating or resting. And so the things that affect that time are going to affect her, her comfort and well-being. With that, at the end of this presentation, I'll be answered to or willing to uh, entertain any questions you may have at this time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. Um, here's uh, your opportunity, everyone, to pose your question. Please type it in the chat box. Um, meanwhile, Dan, I have a question for you, and I'm curious if the three hours per day uh, time away from the pen, does that include the headlock time? I mean, you might have talked a little bit about it, but does that include the time the cows are locked in the headlock? Not necessarily. It's basically the cow, the time they're spent away from the pen, so they don't have an opportunity to use the resting area. They don't have access to feed. So, would, uh, would what's your recommendation then for locking? Because we're seeing more uh, with the AIs and different management happening on dairies. We're seeing more um, uh, the cows being locked in the headlocks quite a bit. So, what's your recommendation for that time? Well, uh, <clears throat> in the study that was done at the University of California, Davis by Overton. You know, that, that cyclical behavior of the cow, if cows are coming back from the milking uh, center and they're spending the first hour eating and then want to go rest, then probably we don't want to exceed an hour uh, locked up after milking. And uh, another question, just a quick one. Is the 100% stocking rate adequate for close-up and fresh cows, and or do you have different... Uh, recommendation for those cows? Well, uh, I think the important thing to keep in mind there is that 30 inches of feed space. We want to have equal opportunity for all those cows to get to the bunk at the same time when feed is delivered. That's the important thing. I think some of the initial things uh, with two row groups in the past, it was generally found about 24 inches of feed space per cow was available in some of the older two-row facility designs without adequate crossovers and so on. And so I think the 80% that sometimes comes up in the discussion um, is that adds that extra six inches. Uh, if that 80% in those older facilities adds that six inches of extra feed space. But there's nothing wrong with underpopulating a group. In fact, that's very common in some other countries is to underpopulate, providing more access because there is good you know, good studies looking at three feet uh, limits those disruptions at the feed bunk and uh, those displacements and things like that, providing more space, especially in mixed parity um, in mixed parity groups where you know first lactation animals may be in with older cows. 
Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, we have a question about uh, your recommendation for sick cows, so facility okay. for sick cows. Um, and definitely should, there should be a space for, for uh, uh, you know, hospital or sick cows where they can be separated. Um, often in, in these would be areas of the barn that I might recommend some kind of a bedded area, especially if, you're, um, if they're lame cows, uh, they have an opportunity to get up more easily, more comfortably with better traction in, in some of those cases. I'm trying to remember the percentages of the herd sometimes in design that just doesn't stick in my head here at the moment. But uh, I think it's absolutely necessary to provide space for hospital cows. Of course, anything with a contagious uh, disease probably should be separated from the maternity area. We don't want to get into the old, what one of my colleagues used to say was the uh, uh, MH. W pen, which is the hospital maternity whatever pen. We don't necessarily want to mix, uh, you know, maternity animals with animals that might be uh, ill or contagious. Uh, but uh, uh, generally, it's it's a good idea to separate them from the group to allow them to recover more quickly. I often joke with producers that the amount of space that you have available for those special cows uh, determines what a sick cow is. Uh, you know, if a, a, a cow is, is lame or, or is appearing to become lame, you can put her there to recover very quickly versus if you don't have the space for, uh, you know, they're, they're at a, a score of five before they uh, are taken out of the group, that type of thing. I don't know if that fully answers your question, but there definitely should be space uh, for that. Um, right off the top of my head, I I, I don't remember those percentages of the herd and the amount of space that should be allowed for them. Okay, and, and you mentioned that we should groom the saws at least three times per day and add fresh bedding frequently. How frequently? I mean, could you provide a little bit? Yeah, more? That, that's going to depend. Um, generally, what I find, uh, the producers that are doing the better job with um, inorganic bedding, uh, such as sand, are generally adding bedding once every week, and then they'll do an additional grooming, basically leveling the stalls uh, maybe three or four days later, kind of halfway through the bedding cycle. Uh, the key with that is that uh, when I first started working with stalls, we had uh, folks that were bedding with sand maybe once every 21 days. And so they would heap these large amounts of sand in the, in the stall so the cows couldn't even get into them, and they would simply be pawing at the stall to to get enough sand out in order to get, you know, in order to use the stall. And so I would see, um, you know, in the range of anywhere from uh, 12 inches or more of uh, difference in bedding height between uh, frequency. And so the real key with generously bedded stalls is keeping a relatively stable uh, bedding layer in there. So addition once a week, you generally end up with less wasted sand uh, as well as uh, the the cow's relationship to the structure remains very similar throughout that bedding frequency compared uh, compared to that. Now with organic beddings, that that's even going to vary with the type of organic bedding that you're using. Um, and typically, we find the ones who win the game are bedding every one to two days in smaller amounts with the organic bedding uh, to keep those stalls comfortable. Uh, in that case. Grooming three times a day is just a good idea and in high, pro especially in high production herds that are eating more dry matter, uh, you know, they're going to be making manure when they're resting as well and so we want to keep those stalls as clean as possible. Any other questions for them? Um, do you recommend bud box to manage cows? Uh, I, you know, that's a, I think that's a great idea, depending on how you're managing the cows. If you're bring, bring, you know, bringing, them, bringing them into a group and want to put them to a, uh, a shoot or something like that, um, I'm relatively new to the bud box, and it, it intrigues me. I haven't, you know, I've seen the videos. I've seen, read the papers. Um, I haven't seen one in my particular area. 
uh, I think it's a great idea uh, as far as taking cows' behavior into uh, account when you're trying to handle them. Now, keep in mind, though, that a dairy cow is a little bit different than a beef cow as far as their association with humans. And so they're probably a little bit easier to handle uh, uh, in many cases, uh, depending on the handler, I guess, um, than, than a beef cow, which I think the bud box is really kind of designed for initially. Good, good question. Great question. Well, I don't see any other question coming, so I'd like to thank Dan for taking time out of his busy schedule to be with us today, and thank okay. you very much. Thank you. My pleasure.